to the project. All right, so um, as I said to our uh, REU students uh, during lunch, um, uh, uh, welcome to all of you who, are, who have just joined us um, for the summer. We're really excited to be uh, working with all of you um, and are excited about the uh, things you'll bring to the project over the, over the course of the summer. I'm Salil, uh, a theoretical computer scientist on the faculty here at Harvard and uh, lead PI on the project. And uh, what I'm going to try to do here is just give you a taste of what this, this project is about, what the high-level goals and what the different pieces are. And over the next day, um, you'll hear about those in more detail. All right, so the, the motivation for our project when we started it a, a few years ago um, was the exciting transformation that was happening throughout the social sciences due to the immense volume and variety of new sources of data on human behavior that were becoming available. All right, so instead of being limited to surveys of a few thousand uh, participants, um, researchers increasingly could do studies on the scale of hundreds of thousands by making use of data from cell phone GPS readings, internet uh, search logs, political blog posts, social network activity, and so on. Um, and in addition, the internet and uh, data repositories like uh, those supported by uh, running the Dataverse, which you'll hear about more uh, later today, um, make it uh, much easier for researchers to share the data obtained from such sources uh, with other researchers to enable replication, reproducibility, and entirely new analyses of the data that's been collected. However, a major problem for realizing the pull, full potential of this, this vision of uh, uh, computational data-driven social science is that many of these sources of data contain sensitive information about individuals. And currently, social science researchers aren't equipped with tools to adequately protect the privacy of the data subjects while analyzing and sharing the data. Okay, so what's the traditional approach for uh, dealing with privacy, not just in social science, but in all human subjects research, it's to strip PII, personally identifying information, from the data set. So you remove obvious identifiers, name, address, social security number, maybe exact date of birth, and so on. And what you're left with um, looks like an anonymous data set. And you might hope that you can now uh, share that data freely without any privacy concerns. Unfortunately, now it's quite well understood, and we'll talk about this more in more detail later, that this traditional approach of stripping identifying information from data sets uh, does not work well, that it uh, is often possible to figure out who the people are in these supposedly anonymized data sets by using the information that remains. And so what you're left with is a very stark trade-off between um, the usefulness of the data on one hand and the privacy that you pr provide to the subjects. If you only remove obvious identifiers, you've just made it slightly harder to figure out who's who in the data set, and you're providing very weak privacy protections. And certainly something that may not be uh, 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 responsible to do if you're going to post the data for sharing in some public repository. On the other hand, if you, if you more aggressively try to de-identify the data and really strip out, try to strip out everything that you can imagine might be useful in identifying um, the individuals in the data set, you often are forced to uh, remove the very information that people are interested in studying. And you're left with a data set that, that has very little utility. Um, so what is the... So the, the consequence of this is that these privacy concerns are coming into conflict uh, with the push for open sharing of data by the research community and funding agencies that um, increasingly there are even mandates uh, by, by journals and funding agencies that if you collect data funded by you know, public funds or published, uh, to publish work in a particular journal, you have to make the data available to others. Um, but uh, uh, because of privacy concerns, many researchers are refusing to share their data, um, and sometimes quite, quite reasonably so, and so we have a, this, this conflict of, of values in, in, uh, in the research community. 
OK, so the goal of the project in cartoon form is to try to uh, reconcile this tension between privacy and open sharing of data. Right? Try to push this privacy versus utility curve um, uh, further out so that you can have uh, uh, retain the usefulness of these data sets while uh, doing a good job protecting the privacy of the subjects. And we want to do this by trying to develop tools for, for researchers to use to more responsibly share their data um, while protecting privacy. And we're trying to do this through a collaboration between several dis different disciplines, I think all of which are represented in the room at the moment. Um, so of course, uh, we need to be working with the social scientists who are uh, uh, collecting and analyzing uh, these, this human subject data that we're, uh, uh, that, that's the, the source of the problem. And what we want to do, of course, in this project is, is enable them to do their, their work better. Um, and so they, social scientists play a big part in the project because whatever we do, it has to be designed to support the work of uh, social scientists. Um, computer science uh, has uh, developed over the past 10 to 15 years a rich understanding of the privacy risks that could be present in data and the sharing of information about uh, uh, data sets and methods to address those and a sort of rich theory for understanding what, you know, what is privacy protection. And uh, law and policy, which um, give us an understanding of what are the responsibilities of researchers in handling privacy uh, sensitive uh, data sets, what are their obligations to their subjects, as well as giving us a set of tools um, that can help in managing the, the responsible sharing of data, legal instruments, to accompany the, the technological ones that may come from uh, computer science, and statistics, which um, uh, is a source of many of the methods used in, in social science for the analysis of data, and also has had a lot of interplay with the computer science thinking about data privacy. Um, so to bring these disciplines together, there are, there are four um, uh, institutes at Harvard that are, are working together. Um, from the School of Engineering and Computer Science, there is the Center for Research on Computation and Society, which is uh, a, a center um, based in computer science that aims to bring uh, computer scientists uh, into interaction with people from other disciplines to do computer science research aimed at problems of societal importance. And it was through CIRCUS, that's uh, C-R-C-S, uh, is how it's pronounced for short. Through CIRCUS is how I personally got interested and became aware of um, research on data privacy. Uh, there's the Institute for Quantitative Social Science, which is where we are right now, um, which, uh, among other things, uh, develops methods and tools uh, for this to enable this transformation that I mentioned earlier that's happening in the social sciences, to, to develop methods and tools for the um, analysis of, you know, the uh, quantitative analysis of, um, uh, of social science data sets, right? So the, uh, tr and turning, helping turn social science from a, uh, 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 from a more qualitative uh, discipline to one that's more quantitative and, and data driven. And the Berkman Center for Internet and Society, which is a center that was founded at Harvard Law School and uh, has a long history of uh, high impact work on the interaction between um, technology and law and policy and uh, other societal issues, problems of uh, governance and innovation and uh, including on issues related to privacy. And they are the ones that um, uh, uh, lead our uh, efforts around law and policy. And then the Data Privacy Lab um, is a, a lab run by Latanya Sweeney, whose work I'll uh, talk about shortly. She's one of the co-PIs on the project, which is housed here in the Institute for Quantitative Social Science. Um, uh, specifically to have an in-house uh, 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 unit uh, helping the social science researchers deal with uh, privacy uh, issues. 
All right, so the, the PIs and senior researchers on the project, um, many of whom you'll meet today and tomorrow, um, not all because some, some, some are away at the moment. Um, all right, so from circus and computer science, uh, in addition to uh, me, there's um, uh, Steve Chong is a faculty member who works in uh, programming languages and programming languages approaches to security. Um, is Steve? Yeah, Steve. Me. He's away. Okay. Kobe um, Nisim, who's sitting there in the in the back, um, is a, is also a theoretical computer scientist. Is one of the founders of work on differential privacy, which plays a big ro role in our project. And you'll you'll hear about that um, later uh, tomorrow, I guess, uh, from. Uh, for me and him, and uh, Marco Gabardi sitting uh, here is visiting us uh, from the University of Dundee in Scotland, and uh, and like Steve uh, works on uh, programming languages, programming languages approaches to security, as well as specifically programming languages approaches to privacy and differential privacy. Um, from uh, IQSS. Uh, we have James uh, Honecker, who's uh, um, a research, senior research scientist here in IQSS, um, social scientist, works on uh, uh, quantitative methods and statistical software. Um, Gary King is the founder and director of IQSS. Um, he's uh, um, uh, so he's very occupied these few days with the Dataverse community meeting that's happening in, in parallel. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it's, uh, he has done too many things over the course of his, uh, his, his career to, um, uh, to try to enumerate them. But the, uh, specifically, the sort of the vision of IQSS uh, uh, for uh, uh, providing methods and tools and data repositories for social science um, is has come under under his leadership, and that's what we are you know trying to support uh, in our in our project through our privacy tools. And Merce Crosas is the is her title now is director of data science, mm -hmm. director of data science um, here in IQSS. She's also very occupied with the Dataverse community meeting, but you, I'm sure you'll get to meet her um, uh, in the near future. And also it, when we attend some of the Dataverse community meeting uh, meeting uh, presentations. You'll probably get to see uh, Gary and Merce. Um, right, the Berkman Center. So Urs Gasser is the executive director of the Berkman Center. He is out of town uh, this week, but I'm sure you'll see him in meetings in the coming weeks. Um, and. Uh, uh, in addition to this project, he, he's, he's done a lot of thinking on other aspects of privacy. The Berkman Center has a number of other projects associated with privacy. David O'Brien also helps our, lead our efforts uh, with the Berkman Center. He's also out of town uh, this week. Um, you'll hopefully meet him soon. Um, Alexandra Wood is a fellow at the Berkman Center, and so um, she's the um, uh, lead who's here at the moment. From MIT, Micah Altman, you'll hear from him tomorrow. He's the director of research at MIT Libraries. He's a, um, a social scientist, works on information science, um, and certainly has interest in the kinds of things we're doing from, from, from his work as, uh, at, at MIT Libraries. Um, Edo Iroldi is the co-PI from uh, statistics. Uh, I guess represented here today by Vishesh, uh, a postdoc uh, uh, working with him and me. And Latanya Sweeney um, is the director of this data privacy lab. And well, she's one of the first computer scientists to start thinking about these sort of data privacy issues to point out the um, failure of the traditional anonymization techniques uh, that uh, people have been using uh, for a long time. All right. So what? What are we, uh, you know, so there are many different problems that one can try to address in privacy and many different places one can try to address those problems um, and can't try to do 
it, you, it's good to have a, a, a concrete focus for the tar as a target for your efforts. And our focus is on uh, data repositories, right? So thinking about these privacy problems from the perspective of uh, a data repository, which is the place where researchers come to share their data with other researchers. Um, in particular, um, we're trying to build tools to integrate into the Dataverse software, which is a, a infrastructure for hosting data repositories. It's used to host uh, repositories in social science and other fields. The instance here at Harvard is, the, by some counts, the largest repository of social science uh, data sets in the world. This screenshot is out of date. I get Dataverse recently, I guess when James' presentation, you'll probably see more up-to-date screenshots on Dataverse. So Dataverse just released a new 4.0 version, which looks much nicer than this. But the, the front, I couldn't find a good page that had all these nice statistics about it uh, um, you know, hosting, I said, think I said so to someone before, 60,000 studies. So 54,000 studies, over 700,000 files, and so on. So um, it's a good place to have as the target of our efforts because it's already an infrastructure that's widely in use. Um, and so if we can build tools into data repositories to help researchers in handling privacy sensitive data, we immediately have a large user base for those tools at our fingertips. Okay, so what is the, the problem? The problem is that currently the um, most data repositories, in particular the, the Dataverse ones, are not equipped to take on privacy sensitive data. So generally speaking, in most Dataverse repositories, the user who comes to upload their data to share with other, other researchers has to assert that there's no privacy constraints associated with the data. And in the cases where it is allowed to upload such a data set, those data sets are typically not made available for download. So you see, like here you can, these are data sets that are, that are considered safe and one can, can download them, but these are restricted data sets. Um, and the only way to get access to, to those uh, data sets is by uh, a manual application for access, which typically has to go back to the original researcher and their institution, and can often be a long process for getting, approval, um, getting approved to have access to the data. Okay, and so the goal is to enable wider access to such data um, while making sure that we're still providing adequate privacy protections to the subjects. Okay, so what, what are the challenges here? Um, so one, which we haven't, haven't talked about yet, is um, even if one thinks about it just from the, the, the legal point of view, what the uh, responsibilities of the researcher are in handling a privacy sensitive data set, um, there is a vast array of different laws and regulations as w in, you know, uh, in addition to disciplinary uh, norms and uh, best practices uh, that a researcher uh, should be keeping in mind and, and, and should be uh, 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 acting consistently with in the handling of any privacy sensitive data set. Um, and so this is just a, you know, a, a list here of a few of this, you know, I mean, the list goes on and on of, of some of the, the, the laws and regulations that the Berkman team has looked at involving health data and uh, education data. These are only ones at the, at the federal level. It's a very, very partial list. And then one, there's also state and local laws and uh, regulations. So navigating even the responsibilities, much less, um, much less acting consistently with them, is, is, is already very complicated. Second is something that I talked about earlier, that the traditional approach of stripping identifiers uh, from data sets provides either very weak privacy protections or very poor utility, or both. Um, and this was the, you know, one of the first striking examples of how, to make it more concrete, how anon traditional anonymization can fail was shown by our co-PI, Latanya Sweeney, in the late 90s um, when she took um, medical insurance claims data that was released uh, by the state of Massachusetts um, and showed how she could identify individuals in that data set. And how did she do it? Well, at that point in time, 
it was considered safe to include zip code, date of birth, and sex in an anonymized uh, data set. And so this medical claims data had, had those fields in it. And she then linked uh, this data set using those fields with publicly available voter registration lists. And it turns out that well over half the US population uh, is uniquely identified by their zip code, date of birth, and sex. Okay, so you would think, I mean, my date of birth, that's not very sensitive. There are a lot of people born on the same day, day as me. A lot of people who live in the same zip code as me. Certainly a lot of people have the same sex as me. Um, but you take the combination of these three things and suddenly you're unique. There's a good chance that you're unique. Right? And so because of that, she was able to identify individuals in this medical claims data and find out their name and address um, from the voter registration list. And in particular, she identified the medical record of William Weld, who was the governor of Massachusetts at the time. Okay, and so that made a big, that was a good way to get a lot of attention uh, on, this, on this problem. I and mean, she was one of the first to, 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 to point it out. Um, and since then, there have been many more examples of this type and often much more subtle. So it's not a matter of just even thinking of your sort of the obvious things that we tra traditionally think of as identifying information. Um, but people have shown that all kinds of subtle things, uh, the dates that you watched a particular movie and may have reviewed it on the internet movie database could help identify you in an, in an anonymized movie rental database. Right? That was shown for the, the Netflix challenge. And there have been many, many other examples. So showing that this de-identification is a really hard task. And certainly you know, a lay researcher who has no experience in privacy and is just trying to do their work, collect interesting data and analyze it and share it with others can't be expected to do de-identification right. And then finally, the other thing that I, I also mentioned before is uh, for data set that is deemed privacy sensitive, the process, right, so people still have the idea that other researchers should be able to access the data if, you know, through uh, by applying and showing that they, you know, maybe getting IRB approval. This can often be a very lengthy and arduous process. Um, we're told, for, for example, for uh, MOOC data coming from Harvard and MIT, that the ed edX data, um, six months of negotiation between institutions is not unheard of. I mean, that's a long delay to put into someone's PhD, like trying to get their hands on a, on a data set. Okay, so we want, we want to try to deal with some of these problems and make, make sharing easier for, for non-expert lay researchers, meaning they shouldn't have to have expertise in data privacy, in computer science or statistics to be able to deal with their, or law, uh, to deal with their uh, privacy sensitive data. All right, and uh, so how are we trying to do this? We're trying to build a bunch of tools. Um, we are thinking about the entire pipeline um, from when a researcher conceives of a, of a, of a study and, and submits a proposal to their IRB uh, to run this study. And also, uh, hopefully, that comes with a data sharing plan, how they're going to share their data with others, to and obtaining the appropriate kind of consent from their subjects, collecting their data. Um, but our uh, main point of intervention, again, is the point in time in which the researcher comes to share the data with others. They come to a data repository like Dataverse and say, okay, I want to make my data available to others, uh, but I'm worried about privacy. How can you help me? Okay, and so the types of things that we're uh, working on, so one, one big component where we've devoted a lot of effort, and you'll hear about later today, uh, is uh, in data tags, which um, is, or there's, there's several different pieces to data tags, but one way of thinking of it, it's a, it's a, it's a tool that helps the researcher sort of navigate through the, the, the legal and other constraints that there might be on the handling of their data, and then come to a conclusion about how to tag the data um, with um, uh, uh, policies to govern its handling by the, by the repository. All right? So from things like, should the, does the data need to be stored encrypted? Two policies about who should have access to the data and what ways uh, can you make access to the data. And when you give someone access to the data, what kind of terms of use do you need to include? 
Okay, and so this is a lot of the legal research in the project um, uh, 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 plays a role in uh, in data tags, as well as uh, uh, there are computer science components for thinking about um, how one designs and optimizes um, uh, uh, the process of uh, surveying a researcher and assigning tags. Another place where we've devoted a lot of effort, and you'll hear, and is a big. Uh, uh, and many of you today are working on, uh, going to be working on this summer, um, is on differential privacy, which is a way of uh, setting up an, uh, a privacy protective interface for doing data analysis. Okay, so instead of letting people download some version of the data set, we're going to try to provide them some interface for doing statistical analysis of the data without downloading it. And we want to make sure that the interface is designed in a way that protects privacy that makes sure that information that shouldn't leak out can't leak out. Okay. Um, and there's other things, uh, I mean, even thinking about how, when, when we're going to do identification, how do we do it better, how do we understand the risks, there's, there's you know, work happening there. Um, informing data tags is all kinds of research on privacy laws and regulations that, that have been done by the, and are still being done by the, the Berkman team. And also thinking about how to inform policy around uh, the handling of privacy sensitive research data and how that should, uh, for example, uh, uh, be taken into account in, in the way IR, IRBs govern um, research um, is also all sort of within, within scope of our project. Um, all right, so let's see, how are we doing on time? All right, so it's been half an hour, I'll wrap up. Um, so the, I'm not going to talk in, in too much detail, just point out some things that maybe didn't, didn't come out before. So uh, part of what we are doing is thinking about the relationship between the way people think about privacy from a legal point of view and the way that it's encoded in laws and regulations and the way in computer science and statistics we think about privacy and, and how can we get these to mesh. Um, if you're interested in that, there are meetings that you can attend to, to hear about and participate in those, in those discussions. Um, a big focus this summer, the first time we have a bunch of the interns who are coming from social science backgrounds, is in, uh, in understanding uh, how can we make our tools actually useful for social scientists to do their work. I mean, evaluating from that, that perspective. So not evaluating from the perspective of what do computer scientists think that social scientists need to do their work, but actually, you know, how can we really make sure that, um, uh, that, that the tools we're build, building can fit into the workflow of practicing social scientists. Um, I mentioned the kind of tools we're working on, the, for example, uh, uh, algorithmic ones like differential privacy and, and legal uh, ones like data tags. And then there's uh, also a bunch of kind of education outreach. One thing that's very important in our project is to try to produce open resources that we make as widely available as possible throughout our work. So it's something to keep in mind for the, the work you do if you're writing code. Um, that's code that we want to eventually make publicly available and they may let, let other, other people use. If you're developing a suite of test data sets, ideally, that's something that we could also make publicly available, unless the data sets are themselves privacy, privacy sensitive. Um, legal work that comes out of the project, we also want to make the, out, the outputs of that as, as available as possible. So keep it in mind in the work that you do this summer. And if you have ideas for, there's this stuff that we're working on that could really, you know, um, that we could package nicely to, to, to make available in some way, please do share those ideas. All right, and then hopefully as we go around and do introductions, um, I think one of the, the sort of educational aspects of the project that hopefully you all will uh, enjoy is the, in, the working with and interaction with a, a, a multidisciplinary uh, team. And uh, um, we'll try to give you all a taste of that and not just have you only sort of in the weeds in your own specific project. All right, I don't think I'm going to try to. You all have this schedule uh, in email, I think. Later today, so after we do introduction. Ah, OK, so we'll do introductions. And then James will talk about Dataverse. And you'll hear about the legal research and data tags. 
tomorrow morning, um, Micah Altman will give some more high-level perspectives on the managing of pri confidential and privacy-sensitive data. I'll tell you a bit about differential privacy in a non-technical way. So this is really for everyone uh, to uh, get a, a taste of what we're working on there. And then um, we are going to move to some more technical, on tomorrow afternoon, more technical uh, tutorials uh, around differential privacy and the programming language R. Pro uh, now, everyone is welcome to attend that. Um, so um, last year we did have some of the, at least one of the law interns did attend some of the more technical tutorials that we did. And in general, throughout the summer, we're happy to, if any of you have interest. So it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't need to relate to your project. If you're interested in attending, please, please do come. Um, Thursday, mainly, um, we have in mind to attend parts of the Dataverse community meeting that's happening over these few days. As we mentioned, a few people are, are kind of missing these meetings because of that. And in the morning, there are some presentations actually you know, very by members of our project team and related to our project. In the afternoon, there's a breakout section, session on sharing of sensitive data, um, uh, which can be interesting to attend. And then on Friday, we're going to continue with more, some more technical tutorials related to differential privacy. Right. And that's a kind of intensive first week. Um, but then going throughout the summer, um, we, we gradually will slow to a more modest uh, uh, frequency of meetings so that, that you can actually work on your projects. Uh, where there's a weekly all hands meeting, which uh, everyone should try to attend. Um, and this is really where we synchronize among all the groups and report on what we're doing. Um, on Mondays and Wednesdays is the uh, time where the, uh, so uh, Monday morning, Wednesday morning is when the, uh, the more sort of technical side of the project working on differential privacy and also doing tutorials on statistics and, and, and uh, programming language uh, R. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be having meetings Monday and Wednesday, two hour meetings Monday and Wednesday morning. Again, others are welcome to join. Uh, Kobe um, leads a, a, a group of a number of people, including um, uh, people from the, the Berkman team, like uh, Alex, uh, on what we call the de-identification working group. But what this is really about, or what its current focus is largely on, is this bridging the way we think about privacy from a computer science perspective with the legal way of thinking about privacy. And so if you're interested in either just listening in on those discussions or participating, um, uh, uh, do do join us. You're welcome. Is there a regular data tags? Not at the moment, but there. You know, that may be. Keep your eye out if uh, if you're kind of interested in the data tags. There, from time to time, there are, there are regular meetings around that. You'll have meetings with your individual mentors, the other interns from your community. Either the C's I, IQSS also has its own REU students. Berkman, I know, has a larger group of interns. We do try to do some group social activities um, during the summer. Um, in particular, last summer we did a group hike. Um, hopefully we can do that again. But if you have any other ideas for either social or intellectual activities that would be fun, just propose them or organize them. Like you could say, uh, I want to organize a reading group on, um, you know, on, on on some aspect of privacy law, or on uh, I don't know, pick your pick pick a favorite you know topic. That's I mean doesn't have to necessarily be related that closely related to the the project. Um, just send out an email to the privacy tools dash all mailing list and say uh, I'm going to organize this. Who wants to join? All right, and Kimia can help find rooms and coordinate. Um, and I think that's about it. I can take some questions and, uh, again, just repeat that we're all really looking forward to, to, to working with you all this summer. Any questions? Yes, Dan. Just going to go over the overview, what would be, in your opinion, the next big, um, the next big advance, uh, the next big step that we're looking for in the project to come out of the project? Uh, 
Great. So I think that's you know, there's you know different pieces have that advance associated with them. I think in general we are now reaching the point in the project where we see the light at the end of the tunnel in that we can really imagine tools that we can put in front of users, at least prototypes that we can you know put in front of users to to start playing with and seeing how well it works for their purposes. This is true both on the side of on the differential privacy as well as data tags, as well as some of the you know, uh, writing that's happening around this kind of de-identification and kind of bridging the CS and law way of, of thinking that those two we, you know, are, can, can now envision getting those to a point where you know, we're producing something that, that can actually be useful in informing users and how they handle data. And so I think in all the parts of the project, that's kind of where we want to push really hard at this point is to, to actually reach, reach that in, you know, you know, in the coming half year or so um, or over the course of the summer. So coming half year, I don't know about, you know, actually, you know, having it for handling some of these things won't be ready to handle actual sensitive data, sometimes for, for some technical issues that we've ignored that would need to be handled in order to, you know, really have it out in the wild. Um, but, I mean, it, it, that's pretty high level, but I think then that can be made more concrete when looking at the, then the specific parts of the project. And when you, when you hear more about, for example, the differential privacy part of the project, you, you, get a sen you might get a sense of what that means. Um, others um, from the you know, team want to comment on big, ambitious goals? I think, I think or just to rephrase exactly the same thing, Part of what's so ambitious about having a tool, even if it's a prototype that isn't actually handling sensitive data, this handling something in the style of sensitive data, having a prototype to put out to make this diverse, is that this will be the first time that a lot of people outside of the CS community have really thought about the existence of these tools even being possible for sharing social science. So for having a prototype in which social scientists can imagine what the workflow could be. For, for dealing with data through the interface and only getting back one of versions of answers, that, that, that will be, be a big step from a social science perspective. A lot of impact and it will change the way social scientists think about the protocol they use for using data and making it a little bit more about privacy presentation. I think this is all or none. I've signed away my life in a contract and I've gone back to the So that's, that's a big change from, from, from a social science it's the same. It's the same step, but it has a big impact on the environment. I should say we we do care. You know, um, th this is kind of an applied outcome of the of the project, and uh, I think it is the thing that I would identify when we think about the project as a whole. This this type type of outcome. Um, but I'm a theorist, and and I I care a lot about, and I think in the project we care a lot about also the scholarly. Uh, outcomes not just in supporting the scholarship of social science but in our understanding of data privacy and uh, that's something that's been happening uh, there's been contributions of that type happening throughout the project and they're continuing to happen and we're going to continue to push on those and those are also important to us and they're you know they're really interesting open problems and uh, questions and in, in, in all of those as well um, but if I had to pick out a single thing I think it would be what James said All right, great. So why don't we go around and do introductions um, and uh, 